Greetings, everyone. My name is Nancy Koppelman, and I'm very happy to invite you all to join us for the second lecture of Pandemic Academy. Our lecturer today is Carolyn Prouty. She's a member of the faculty here at Evergreen. She holds a BA in Biological Sciences and a Doctorate of Veterinary Medicine from Cornell University. She has expertise in public health, health sciences, uh, and bioethics, and her program this quarter is entitled Irrepressible Bodies, Hope, Health, and Resilience in a Turbulent World. She volunteers with an international grassroots advocacy organization called Results. Uh, Results is a movement of passionate, committed, everyday people using their voices to influence political decisions that will bring an end to poverty. Thank you, Carolyn, and thanks everyone for joining us. There we go. Great. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Nancy. And um, Nancy, did you were you going to read the land dedication or no? I, I thought you had an idea of how you wanted to do okay, that. Okay, great. Well, um, we want to, I want to, I do want to um, acknowledge the land that we are on. We're not all on the same land because um, we're in many different places. Um, I really want to um, say that wherever we are, we are likely on native land and we honor the ancestors and pay respect, um, respect to the elders and all native peoples, past and present, of all the lands on which we're now residing. Um, I also really want to take the time to honor the lives of those who have perished from this virus and offer words of comfort and accompaniment to the family and friends of those um, who have been so, who are so swiftly gone. I'm really glad to be here, and I'm really honored to follow Dr. Zoltan Grossman, who initiated this series of uh, lectures, and I'm glad um, to join the many who will follow after me. And I'm really grateful to the many people who've helped make this whole series happen, um, particularly the amazing staff who are here now and many who are um, behind other, all kinds of other scenes who've made... Um, our way that is the faculty's transition to remote learning so successful. So really grateful for that. Um, and I also want to say I'm very grateful to the many researchers, public health workers, healthcare workers, journalists, colleagues, um, whose work and wisdom I've drawn on in assembling this talk. Uh, I will post the slides for those who um, have access on Canvas and, uh, excuse me, on the WordPress site. And um, it has all there, I'll just say that um, I've drawn on a number of different people's work, and there are also uh, resources listed in the uh, on the on the WordPress site. Um, and I'll just a little bit of uh, so I plan to talk for somewhere a little less than an hour or so, and then I'll take a ten minute break, and then I'll talk a little bit more, and then we'll have time for questions, and you can put your questions in the Q and A and uh, at the bottom. But why don't you hold off um, until we um, are ready for questions, please. Okay. So what I hope to do is take you on a tour through social epidemiology. Um, the title of my talk, not sure if that was said, was uh, The Social Epidemiology of COVID-19, Who is Getting Sick and Why? So social epidemiology, what is that? Let's start with what is epidemiology. Um, so that's the study of health in populations. And social epidemiology studies how social advantage and disadvantage influence the distribution of health and disease in groups of people. So where do we start with this? Um, this has been a rapidly moving uh, time, even um, I'll reflect on what, where we were a week ago um, is different from where we are now. But I wanna start with um, Flint, Michigan uh, mayors, um, Sheldon uh, Neely's uh, comments, he put it best when he spoke of the pandemic as, a crisis on top of a crisis with a side of crisis. So it's really a remarkable time that we're in. Um, I want to try to answer the question, um, who's getting sick with, with COVID-19? And then I will explore why populations, some populations in particular, are being so hard hit both in the U.S. and globally with an eye on racial and economic disparities that have been revealed by this pandemic. And I'll finish with a few ideas and hopes for where we might go from here. So I'll say when I started planning this lecture a few weeks ago, I, like everyone else in public health, was waiting with dread 
for the news that we knew would come that the people who would get COVID-19 and be the most ill and be the most likely to die were and are the people who are already bearing a disproportionate burden of ill health even before the pandemic. Just one week ago, it was announced at the White House uh, that Black Americans and other people of color are dying at rates disproportionate to their representation in, um, in their communities. Some found this shocking, and I'm sure that many of you also did not. Um, I want to draw some lines from the past to the present and uh, to help explain this disproportionate disease. And I'll see if I can um, take, uh, take us to some important choices and opportunities ahead. So I'm going to share some slides. There we go. Okay, so there's the talk. So who is getting sick? <clears throat> More than a third um, of American adults are at higher risk of serious illness if they get infected with the coronavirus, according to the Kaiser Family Foundation and um, their analysis of CDC, of the Center for Disease Control data. So for most of the people um, who are at most at risk, their age is what puts them in danger. The remaining um, are younger, but have ongoing underlying health issues um, that you've been hearing, no doubt you've been hearing quite a bit about. This is an amazing uh, website that I would recommend um, that you check out as a part of the CDC. And what they've done is create something called a social vulnerability index. And this is going to really help bring together some of the maps that Zoltan showed uh, last week um, with some of the material I'm going to be presenting. These databases and maps are used to prioritize resources, um, to plan evacuations, and where ongoing support may be needed. It's a very interactive website, um, and it gives a lot of detailed local information about your own community's social vulnerability if you're interested in, in it. Um, so if you have been following the news, you also know that collecting data about social vulnerability and about who are the people who are most affected in this pandemic is something that's actually gotten quite a bit of attention, even congressional um, attention. And it's really critical that we do gather, gather um, important uh, and detailed data in order to um, know where to deploy resources, in order to um, uh, identify and contain the, the spread of the virus. Um, and it really helps us to target those who are most vulnerable. So data, one um, metaphor that someone put was the data is like the, um, it's like a police dashboard or, or dash cam, recording what's going on an ongoing basis. So we really need this information. This map um, shows the share of adults at higher risk of uh, <clears throat> serious disease um, who are younger than 65 and you can see that there's certain states where quarter of adults um, under 65 have some kind of um, something that puts them at risk and you can see that they're concentrated in the south and I'm going to come back to talk about what might be happening there in a couple of slides this, um, this share of um, folks under 65 has a high, um, it shows people who have a higher risk of developing more serious disease. And it shows that it varies across the country from 49% in West Virginia to 30% in Utah. More than three quarters of the COVID-19 patients who require ICU treatment in the US had underlying health issues and have heart disease, diabetes, chronic lung conditions. Those are the things that you've been reading about and we're gonna talk more about Particularly underlying heart disease um, is one of the most uh, dangerous for folks. 20% um, of people who have some kind of heart disease end up in the ICU and often um, perish. Here's another map that's more projecting risk forward. So counties that may be vulnerable as the virus spreads, the darker blue is indicating a higher risk level um, and you can see that that's that score for the social vulnerability index. Um, what's the score across the top? 
38% of American adults have a higher risk of developing serious illness from the virus. Of that group, just over half are at elevated risks, as I said at the beginning, because they're over 65. And that includes about 1.3 million people who are living in nursing homes in the United States. The rest, about 45%, are um, of the most, those at most risk, are at higher risk, again, because of those diseases that I talked about, including chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, uncontrolled asthma, diabetes, um, or obesity. And we also want to include in that the 5 million adults who are at higher risk for getting serious illness if they become infected um, and who are also uninsured. This is a, um, an article that really um, began to look at what is happening in that map that we looked at before. What's happening in the South to make it um, uniquely threatened, in particular young people um, seem to be dying from COVID-19 at a higher level there. And so why is that? The numbers emerging seem to indicate that more young people, again, in the South, are dying from COVID-19. Although the majority of coronavirus-related deaths in Louisiana are still among people over 70, 43% of reported deaths have been in people under 70. In Georgia, people under 70 make up half of the reported deaths. And that's in contrast to a place like Colorado, where only 20% of deaths are people under 70. So these statistics suggest that middle-aged and working-aged adults in some southern states are at much greater risk and more likely to die of COVID-19. These differences are not innate to southerners. They are the results of policy. Here's my bumper sticker for the talk. Viruses don't discriminate but policies do. Health disparities tend to track both race and poverty, and the states in the old domain um, of Jim Crow have pursued policies that ensure that these, these disparities endure. This is what we're seeing. The South is the poorest region in the country. The poor, Black, Latino, or rural residents who make up large shares of Southern populations tend to lack access to high quality doctors and care. Many of these states spend less than $25 per person on public health a year, compared with $84 per person in New York. Nine of the 14 states that have refused to expand Medicaid to poor residents under the Affordable Care Act are in the South. Um, one of the things that uh, a future pandemic, pandemic academy talk will uh, spend time on is the extreme vulnerability of people in prison who are detained or incarcerated to the coronavirus. And the South incarcerates a larger proportion of its population than anywhere in the United States. So that might also explain part of what's going on. And finally, Southern states have some of the lowest ratios of active physicians to patients in the country. And if healthcare providers are sickened, they will not be able to contend with waves of hospitalization that may happen. So now I wanna to turn to um, some uh, racial disparities, and this is something that, again, has been getting a lot of attention in the news, particularly in the last week or so, and um, here's an um, article from the Washington Post and some dramatic graphs on the left of these, and I'll, in the next slide, go show you a little bit closer so you can see, but on the, the left-hand data point is the percent of uh, African Americans in the population and the right um, higher uh, per, uh, data point is the percent of deaths in that same place. We can see that counties that are majority black have three times the rate of infections and almost six times the rate of deaths as counties where white residents are in the majority. So as I mentioned at the beginning, this was what we were expecting, you know, folks in public health um, from the beginning, and it is, um, it's really disturbing that this is what we're, that this is what we're seeing. Here's a close up and just a few examples of this. In Milwaukee County, where Wisconsin's biggest city is located, blacks account for about 70% of the dead, but just 26% of the population. The disparity is similar in Louisiana, where 70% of the people who have died were black, but make up just 32% of the state's population. In Illinois, um, a disparity nearly identical to Michigan exists at the state level, but the picture becomes far starker when looking at the data just from Chicago. 
where black residents have died at a rate six times that of white residents. Of the city's 118 reported deaths, nearly 70% were black. In that same article in the Washington Post, this is the US Surgeon General Jerome Adams. Um, he's 45 and he shared this. Uh, I've shared myself, myself personally that I have high blood pressure, that I have heart disease and spent a week in intensive care unit due to a heart condition and that I actually have asthma, diabetic. And so I represent that legacy of growing up poor and black in America. Mainly gonna concentrate and we'll come back to talking about racial disparities um, and uh, in a little bit later in the talk, I do wanna bring forward some other disparities um, that I will just spend a little bit of time on and there's many groups um, who have been historically marginalized and minoritized and otherwise um, um, have resulting health disparities. So I won't mention all of them, but I just want to spend a little bit of time on gender. Gender has clear and important connections to the disparities being revealed by the pandemic. Women form about two thirds of the health workforce globally. In fact, more than 90% of healthcare workers in China's Hubei um, province are women and women are overrepresented in healthcare in the United States as well. Women across the world already shoulder the burden of unpaid and low paid, uh, and low paid care work, but caring responsibilities due to COVID-19 are falling even harder on women who are more likely to earn less, work part-time, or be in more insecure work. This is another concern. Um, confinement is expected to increase risks of um, intimate partner violence for displaced women and girls, while worsened socioeconomic situations will expose refugee women and girls in particular to increased risk of sexual exploitation by community members as well as humanitarian workers. That's what this is talking about. In parallel, access um, to uh, regular services is likely to be um, come challenging for, for survivors. Issues of reproductive rights, including abortion, prevention of gender-based violence, domestic abuse, access to healthcare, and much more have clear intersections with this pandemic. I also wanna talk some about the experiences of um, folks who are, um, have disabilities, and I wanna read some of their words. Um, this uh, op-ed written by, what was it on there? Okay, um, um, Elliot Kukla wrote in the New York Times, like many people all over the world, I'm not leaving the house now. For me, though staying home is nothing new. I am in bed as I write this, propped up by my usual heap of cushions, talking to other sick and disabled people all day on my laptop about how the hell we're gonna care for one another in the coming weeks with a gnawing feeling of dread in my belly. Here's another piece. And this one, by Karen Willison, who writes, as someone at high risk due to my physical disability, cerebral palsy, I'm afraid of being infected, and I worry about my parents and other older relatives too, but there is something I fear more. I am terrified of dying from COVID-19, not because my death is inevitable, but because my life may not be viewed as worth saving. So I'm not going to talk. There's other, again, folks who are um, farm workers who are really being targeted. We will hear more about that in future talks. Um, refugees and their particular uh, vulnerabilities. Um, again, folks who are incarcerated and detained. So we will hear some more about them. But what I wanna do now is transition to, so that was a bit of the who, who's getting this and who's um, most at risk. I wanna do a little bit of a, back up and talk about um, why people get sick. And this is a sort of a 101 of, of public health. And what I wanna talk about is the social determinants of health. So when we think about what determines our health, generally we think of most commonly, the first things that come to mind for most people are what we eat, what we get, uh, do we get exercise, what kinds of substances do we take in our body in terms of drugs or alcohol. So usually think of those, we might think about what kind of access to healthcare we have, things along those lines. Um, and we might also think about, of course, income and education. 
So here are the ones, a list of what people often think about when they think about what determines our health and maybe roughly in the order that people, people think about them, where we work, of course, education, our childhood experiences, what sort of social supports we have. We've certainly been hearing about that in the pandemic. But what I wanna do, actually, let me back up here. Oh, it didn't go, okay. <laughs> Let's see, oh yeah, we can do it, yes. So what I wanna say before I move on, so this is often the order that we think of that. And of course, all of these really interrelate. Of course, our income is related to our education. Um, our access to healthcare services is related to, uh, you know, our income. Um, so these are very much interrelated. But the Public Health Agency of Canada um, did a number of years ago sort of a ranking and looked that actually seem to have the most influence on our health. And this, this research has been repeated many, many times by many other folks. So now I'm gonna reorder these in the order roughly, again, these all interact, but in the order that we seem to find make the most difference in people's health. So the highest one for sure, uh, that which is the most, has the most influence on our health, is our income and social status, what's sometimes called socioeconomic status or SES. Our social supports and that those who are around us um, make a, a really big difference. And again, you can read the order as we go down. Certainly our personal health habits and sometimes called health behaviors absolutely have an influence on our health and they have less of an influence overall than these uh, structures um, that are around us, these social structures are what are called the social determinants of health. I'm gonna add one in, this is the same in a little bit different order, because when the Public Health Agency of Canada did this, they didn't include as its um, things like race and racism, gender and misogyny, and other systemic oppressions, and clearly those have intersecting influences on all of these as well. So these are, this is the bread and butter of public health, the social determinants of health, sometimes defined as the circumstances in which people are born, grow up, work, age, and are ill, or in terms of health care. And if you noticed, actually, maybe I'll just go back for a sec, health services, though I'm going to spend time talking about health services um, and health care, health care actually has a relatively small influence on our overall health. Where we live matters a great deal. And um, you can see all the different things that this relates to. The reason that I'm bringing this up is when we study uh, racial disparities, one of the things that people often talk a lot about because it has so much historical and political uh, it's been so it's it's been uh, so influenced by um, history and politics. I should put it that way. Is where we live, where we live determines our access to, as you can see, education, job opportunities. Do we have safe, affordable health housing? Our neighbors are in our feeling of safety. Our connections there. Can we get um, nutritious uh, food? Is it safe to go outside, to exercise and walk and play? Are we near nature? Do we get vitamin G, the green around us? How much influence is there are toxins? We will come back to that. Whether or not there's access to good um, quality care, we learned about that in the South and how that is actually harder to get in some places. Affordable, reliable public transportation and other public services. And of course, social cohesion and social capital, which we learned um, a good deal about from um, learning about community resilience from uh, Zoltan. So all of these are both geographically um, and otherwise related. So um, quite a bit matters. And especially if we think about it, we're staying in place. We're staying where we are. And so all of these different things are um, even, have become even more important in this pandemic. So the social determinants of health um, help to explain 
really our access to resources. So I would now want to connect these social determinants of health to talking about healthcare disparities. Disparities are um, differences that if there were if there were otherwise equity or equality, that would not be. So differences in the health populations by advantage and disadvantage, getting back to that social epidemiology question. So disparities in social determinants are caused by unequal access to resources. And these kinds of resources tend to be the most influential in what actually matters. So making that translation from the social determinants of health to people's actual health. Do we have knowledge and education? In this case, you can certainly see with, with a, a virus, do people know how to protect themselves and the importance of it and what that means? Money, we're gonna come back to that. Power, social capital, different kinds of privilege or discrimination, and particularly the important ability to control our circumstances and react positively to change. What is our ability to be resilient as individuals and um, we heard about as a community? So one way that we can think about this is that all of these different resources make a difference in our choices, whether or not we have choice um, and how we can manage or cons uh, how we manage our choices. So are we, um, do we have choice or are we constrained in our ability to choose? And choosing, the reason why I use that um, um, care is because often people are blamed for making quote unquote bad choices. And so I want to think a little bit more about choices and responsibility and how we hold people responsible for their choices. So I want to say that our choices are always shaped by a wider set of economics and social policies and politics. Again, viruses don't discriminate, but economics, social policies, and politics may well do that. So the choices that we make all come from within the choices that we have and from our agency in making choices. So our sense that we have an ability to shape our lives and all of those different social determinants and the other resources that we talked about come and make a difference in our ability to make these choices. So again, I want to um, have us be cautious when we think about how we blame people for quote unquote good or bad choices that they make and recognize the context in which all of us are making our choices. I also want to tell, um, this, is, this begins to get to the sort of the American um, phrase and the one of the ways that we tend to blame the poor as a group. Um, the phrase that's often used um, as a way of describing the kind of individualism that we have pull ourselves up by our bootstraps. I just learned this about a week and a half ago about the etymology, the origin of that, um, of that phrase. And it turns out that actually in the early 19th century, it meant the exact opposite of how we use it. So to pull yourself by, up by your own bootstraps is in fact impossible. And that's how it was originally used. Like one can't pull themselves up by their own bootstraps. And it transformed into this use in the um, early 20th century, where it's you, uh, used to say, you should. And we hold, again, people responsible for pulling themselves up by their own bootstraps. So I wanted to bring that in. All right. Great. So now I want to move on to the next piece, connecting the who, who's getting sick. And we've got this context of maybe a little bit why people get sick. Um, and I want to make that next translation into what actually happens. How is it that these social determinants of health influence our actual our bodies? So I get to I have the privilege of teaching physiology as well, which I love. And um, so I want to make here is the connection that I want to make that how much of how um, these social determinants not the only way, but one of the ways that the social determinants, we embody them is through stress. So I want to just do a little bit of an uh, introduction to the physiology of stress and why we get sick in that way. Stress makes a huge difference in our health. 
I'll let you look at some of the different um, ways that stress matters to us. Um, things like poor air quality, lack of safe and recreational space. Not only is that hard on our body in terms of the particulate matter that we're taking in, it's also stressful um, if we're not able to recreate and relax. Re residential segregation um, is one of the most important ways that, as I was saying, racial disparities become embodied. And that, can, that has a huge influence on our stress, economic insecurity, um, street, uh, all violence and safety, and um, availability of food. So you can read, see the rest of these. So all of these can have a really big influence on, our, on our, the stress that we're having and on our um, the stress that we're having, and I'll say that it is um, that these are cumulative, and we're going to talk about how stress physiology um, differs from uh, whether it's just a short time or a longer time. So, the physiology of stress. So um, one thing to know is that we are well equipped to deal with stress. That is how our bodies t work. It's very good that our bodies know how to deal with stress. It's adaptive. And one way that we think about that physiology is that it's these nerves and chemical reactions that are meant to help us ensure our physical survival. So what's happened and the reason why stress is now getting to be bad, hard for us is that um, our bodies haven't kept up with the transition to having ongoing stress. So stress used to evolutionarily in our bodies be something that was very short term, and then we would be able to return back to not stressing, but um, having, but this ongoing stress is, um, and even being able to just think about something and get stressed, not just have that is um, something that we have as an ongoing presence in our in our lives. This is very familiar to us right now. So, um, so let's look at the physiology of stress. Um, stress responses involve three basic systems, our nervous system, our hormones or endocrine system, and also our immune system. We often think a lot about the immune system. Maybe you've probably heard about that relationship between our immune system and our uh, and stress, um, but it also certainly is mediated by our nervous system and our hormones. So the key thing about difference in what's happening in our body is whether it's um, happening very sh shortly or acute, so very suddenly, and we're thinking about the time, sort of the time span of seconds to hours, versus chronic or prolonged stress. And there we're talking about days to weeks. And the difference in, um, in our body is really remarkable in terms of what, how stress has a different influence at these different times. So you've heard of cortisol, no doubt. It's the hormone that's most associated with, uh, maybe no doubt, maybe you have, maybe you haven't. Um, the hormone that's associated with stress. So let's look at what happens um, in the body when ongoing high levels of cortisone are happening or are released. So it is absolutely true that it can impair our immune system and our ability to heal. And it actually does it in a couple of, it both makes it harder to fight off infections. It also can make the part of our immune system that is trying to regulate um, how we respond to things from the outside, it can make it even kind of hyperactive. And that's when we can things, see things like autoimmune diseases where our body is uh, attacking itself. So that is a similar regulation, uh, dysregulation that happens and can be associated with stress. Um, so it's not just your body's inability to fight off infection, it also can be, other parts of it can be kind of on high alert. Stress can actually lead directly to obesity and diabetes um, by this, the effects of the cortisol on our pancreas, on our liver, and others. And then finally, the one, there's some other ones, but this is one main one that I want to talk about, chronic inflammation. So inflammation, when we think about classically, it's like you get a poke, a sliver in your finger, and it turns 
warm and red and swollen and hot and painful. When we are stressed, one of the things that happens is that inflammation is triggered throughout and that can relate, can result in heart disease or cardiovascular disease. So vessels, the, heart, the blood vessels, as well as our heart. It can result in stroke, cancer, immune disorders, many, many other things. So chronic inflammation is often the mediator between stress and what's happening in our uh, body. And as you've probably heard about in terms of COVID-19 and what it's doing, it also, you can hear that it's also having an influence on these same systems. So again, heart disease is one of the biggest dangers for people who have COVID-19. Um, and if you've already got some heart disease going on and chronic inflammation, it's that much more easily damaged, unfortunately. So again, all of these can increase our susceptibility to the COVID-19 virus and infection. Okay, here's the biology uh, slide that you've all been waiting for. I'm, there's the quiz, we'll cover all of this at the end. So <laughs> this is um, mainly just to say at the top of this is stress, and at the, um, there, at the bottom of it is a disease. There's many, many different pathways can cause disease. And if you see in the middle there, you might see things about blood sugar. Yep, that can be related to diabetes and others. Oh, look, there's those cytokines um, in the middle. You've maybe heard about cytokine storms that are um, part of what can happen if there is uh, respiratory distress syndrome happening associated with COVID-19. There are some different problems that can cause with the heart, clotting problems. So all of these can be um, uh, are, are different responses to stress that can happen that are mediated through our nervous system and our endocrine system. Okay, so one more transition. Why are some people getting sick more than others? So we've answered who's getting sick and some background about why people get sick in general. So I want to now make this translation to why are some people more people some people getting more getting sick more than others? So we need to start first with where were we before COVID nineteen? I want to back up before we talk about um, individuals and talk about our healthcare system. Excuse me, and our public health system in particular. So in um, the years before um, the outbreak, where we were um, was. Um, a, a big a disinvestment in public health. Um, between 2008 and 2017, state and local health departments lost more than 55,000 jobs, one-fifth of, of the workforce, which is a major factor as um, cities are struggling to respond to COVID-19. One public health official said the problem with providing more money now only and only at times of emergency is it doesn't allow time to recruit and train new workers, just as with other parts of healthcare. That's also true for public health. He said, we waited until the house was on fire before we started interviewing firefighters. In 2008, the Association of Schools and Programs in Public Health um, warned that by 2020, oh, that would be now, um, that we would be um, facing a, a short of, of 250,000 public health workers. And indeed, that's, that's just where we are. Public health, um, in particular, lost jobs as a lot of restructuring happened in our economy, including around education, um, around the recession in 2008. So there was a big cutback then, and many of those jobs were never replaced. Were we before this crisis? In general, um, I want to talk about some of the economic stresses that have been um, uh, that were in place even before um, the pandemic. So the chart on the left here shows um, that half of the households with incomes below the poverty level are not confident that they could handle a $400 expense. This is before the pandemic. And um, so you can see, of course, there's been considerably more than that now. So we're talking about, so the, this is why you know the 
um, dramatic uh, programs that are you know trying to be put into place to try to help with this. Um, on the right is a um, a chart from the Joint Center for Housing Studies at Harvard University, and it shows <clears throat> that from even, again, before the pandemic, people of color were more likely to come under um, the threat of eviction. Of course, the legacy of structural racism and policies um, over the last, not just the last few decades, but the last few centuries has really, is really where this is showing up. And where housing costs continue to go up and wages Half of the renter households of color are cost burdened. Cost burdens means paying more than 30% of income on rent or mortgage and having difficulty paying um, for monthly household expenses. And this is even true for a third of homeowners. Um, uh, black homeowners or households of color, excuse me, um, are also cost burdened. So a third of them are also um, paying more than 30% of their income on mortgage. So it's why the kinds of um, legislation that are being put forward, like eviction or trying to be put forward, eviction moratoriums, helping pay for rent and mortgage are such major goals politically right now. We need to also talk about, in terms of racial disparities, um, to really begin with the racial income gap, and then I'll talk about the racial wealth gap. So you can see here the representation of um, median household income and race. So for every dollar um, in income uh, for um, white families, you can see um, that which is for Hispanic, uh, American Indian, Amer and Alaskan Native families. One dollar to 72 cents, 62 cents, or 59 cents. Actually, I want to say one other thing about that, which is that this racial income gap is the same as it was in 1978. That was the year that the war on poverty peaked and the, some of the reductions went down, but from that time it has not improved. It's still true. So sometimes people think we've made more progress than we have and there may be places that we have, but in terms of the racial income gap, this is not a place that progress has been made. Here's, uh, so that's about income coming in. This is about household wealth and differences between white, black, Hispanic, and other race uh, median net worth. And uh, another representation of that for every dollar of wealth that whites have, blacks have 10 cents, Latinos have 12 cents, and other races have 38 cents. So what this means, let's bring it back to thinking about where we started with the social determinants of health and what was the most important determinant of health was income and socioeconomic status. So let's talk a little bit more about um, some of these racial disparities. This is an article that came out relatively recently showing, um, showing indeed that African Americans have contracted um, and died of coronavirus at an alarming rate. Dr. Kamara Jones is a um, physician, a family physician, and um, an epidemiologist, and a past president of the American Public Health Association, and one of my heroes. She said, COVID is just unmasking the deep disinvestment in our communities, the historical injustices, and the impact of residential segregation. She said, this is the time to name racism as the cause of all of those things. The overrepresentation of people of color and poverty and white people and wealth is not just a happenstance. It's because we're not valued. I want to look a little bit at some of the how these health disparities show up, again, making that translation of income and other social determinants of health, how they track, in this case, of particularly with race. So this has a fair amount going on, so I'll say the first thing to pay attention to is that heart disease, so this is looking at racial and ethnic disparities in heart disease, 
AIDS is a leading cause of death in the United States. In fact, it's the leading cause of death in the world. Um, and it differs by race, race and ethnicity. And if you can see, so across the bottom is different years and um, deaths per 100,000 people um, are what's going up the, along the side. So the higher is higher rates of death. So for everyone between 1999 and 2017, the rates of death by heart disease did go down, but still um, black, not Hispanic folks are more than twice as likely to die of heart disease as some other groups. So here's these risk factors, and I'll let you, I'll just spend a minute with each of these um, that we heard about because we can think about these again, remembering that they are related to what is going to make someone more likely to be hospitalized, have severe disease, and potentially die of COVID. So hypertension or high blood pressure is, again, overrepresented, particularly um, in Black and non Hispanic folks. Diabetes, also different um, distributions. And diabetes, I'll say, there's been a lot of talk about, um, about diabetes and its relationship to COVID. There's a number of different ways that it makes um, the pathophysiology or the way that things can go wrong worse. With high blood sugar, so this is sometimes called sugar, um, that with high blood sugars that are associated with um, diabetes, there are, um, there's more inflammation. We learned about the, the harm of inflammation. Another piece that is happening is that um, as we're learning that inflammation is a really big problem with um, some of the disease processes of COVID-19, one of the ways that, that uh, physicians are treating it is with steroids or things that are like steroids to try to reduce inflammation. And those can actually aggravate diabetes. And so people who have even been under control with their diabetes um, can have their blood sugars can get out of control when they're in the hospital. And that ends up having um, a worse effect on mortality, um, meaning they're more likely to die if their blood sugars are out of control. And so this going into it is part of the reason why um, people are having uh, it, it's a, um, a real susceptibility to severe disease. Obesity similarly is um, distributed differently and obesity often really understood as a dysregulation of energy flow. It has, can have a lot to do with liver function. So it's, it's likely to be less about actual um, issues with uh, with the actual tissue, fat tissue, but it turns what we're learning more and more is that fat tissue is very endocrinologically or hormonally active, and it's likely related to that that it's causing some of the problems that it is with uh, um, with COVID nineteen and and some of the other things that are associated with uh, with obesity. So putting these together, um, this, this is looking at some more health disparities, particularly this is for African Americans and whites. And what this is saying is not only is there higher uh, prevalence of high blood pressure, but there is also, it's also happening at a younger age. And maybe this reminds us a little bit of what's happening maybe in some places in the South and elsewhere, um, why younger people might be more likely to be uh, getting sick and dying of COVID-19. So an earlier onset of high blood pressure and an earlier onset also of diabetes for versus whites. One of the things that um, I haven't spoken about yet is what's called comorbidities. Comorbidities are having more than one of these at once, and that's actually quite common. Um, Van Jones, who some of you may know, who's uh, an, an activist, said, you know, we need to talk to people about comorbidities. They're really important, but nobody's going to understand comorbidities. So here's what we need to ask. Do you take pills every day? If you take pills every day, that means you've got probably more than one thing, and you need to stay inside. 
Do you have sugar? That's what diabetes is called. Do you have pressure? That's what hypertension or high blood pressure is called. Stay inside or you will die. Okay, this is a perfect place for us to take a pause and I'm going to take about a 10 minute break and we're going to move on to looking at this um, from uh, a little bit, yeah, it's a, it's a great place for break. So it's just about 10 up and um, we will come back here. Let me get myself back here and stop sharing. 152, let's come back at after two. See you soon. Okay, I'm going to assume we are. Uh, welcome back. Thank you for coming back. Uh, so um, I'm going to go ahead and continue where we were. And continue to talk um, some about uh, what's happening um, around some of the, in particular, the um, racial health disparities and what's behind them. And of course, they're tightly tied with economic disparities. What I want to do is go through um, some of the information that my guess is that you've already heard, but put categories and then go into perhaps some of the connections between economic disparities, um, folks of color, excuse me, economic disparities, health disparities, um, health care disparities, and racism, and sort of put all of those to, um, together. So I want to start with um, economic disparities that put uh, people of color at risk and um, disproportionately. So we know that folks of color are disproportionately incarcerated and detained, um, that they are more likely to be houseless, renters at risk for eviction, living with others and sharing space with many, which of course is really relevant now in terms of <clears throat> um, likelihood of exposure to the virus. More likely to work in lower wage jobs in food service in restaurants and entertainment and other service industries. More likely to be essential workers. Um, during a recent Amazon strike, one black woman asked, how can we have essential workers when our lives are not essential? More likely to uh, lack paid sick leave. So all of these um, can put people at greater risk. And again, I think that you've likely heard about a lot of them, and we can talk more about these and questions if you'd like. So that's economic disparities. I want to think healthcare disparities that put people of color at risk. So again, we talked about some of the comorbidities that are more common in folks of color, asthma, high blood pressure, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, obesity, other lung diseases. Also, um, discrimination in healthcare. I'm going to talk more about that. Differences in access and differences in quality of uh, the healthcare that's available, leading to differences in treatment and testing. In fact, there was a um, um, study, I'm just going to look for my notes here. Um, the biotech data firm Rubik's Life Sciences, based in Boston, reviewed recent billing information in several states and found that an African American with symptoms like cough and fever was less likely to be given one of the scarce coronavirus tests. So we see that I'm going to talk more about bias in just a minute. Certainly disparities, disparities in diagnosis and treatment is long known in uh, the healthcare field. And um, there's a report that was put out by the Institute of Medicine in 2003 called Unequal Treatment that asked, how are you treated when care? Again, we talked that that's not the same as health. Um, that's by the time you've gotten to health care. And this is not about access. Um, this is for folks who are already there. How are you treated when you're there? And unfortunately, from 2003 to now, there's been um, a remarkable lack of progress in um, improvement in diagnosis and treatment and other aspects of health care for folks of color. And I'll give some examples. 
And again, I think I talked about earlier, so challenges in access, few and poor quality services, lack of insurance and distance from home, having to spend lots of time getting there. So all of these, again, increase our likelihood, the likelihood of exposure to the virus. And again, these may be familiar to you. And it's important to talk about racism directly. Um, race, as we know, is not biological. What is, um, what makes the difference um, is the historic structures and current structures that have um, continued to put people um, of color at risk in many different ways. So the history of discrimination in healthcare is really well known and um, a lack of trust is something that's unfortunately too well known and has people, and this has been folks of color, particularly black folks, um, avoid seeking health care. The word Tuskegee and the Tuskegee experiments that were done years ago, the Tuskegee syphilis experiments, um, now is in some ways used to signal the idea of institutional racism as much as to bring in the memory of that, uh, that particular study and that example of racism. Current discrimination in healthcare um, happens in virtually every disease. It's been well documented in many, many different diseases. And I will um, give an example about pain relief in a minute, but there's many others. And then implicit bias. So implicit bias is the bias that um, that which is our automatic thinking before we have a time to think and make the associations that we make. Um, the unfortunate thing is that we will often act upon those biases and uh, so um, we um, and it may end up in as I was talking about before less testing potentially less aggressive treatment that's not been documented in this uh, particular pandemic but it has been documented in others and it is a concern certainly for a lot of folks so to think a little in medicine, and again, remembering that medicine means health care, which is different from health. So there is definitely implicit bias in the delivery of care. It shows up in a few ways. Um, spending less time with patients, spending having less involvement in medical decisions, so more uh, paternalistic kinds of um, relationships with uh, between healthcare providers and patients, and then this misperception of pain tolerance that I'll talk about in the um, in the next slide is the most recent study, but it's been documented, unfortunately, for quite a while. Also, less effective care. Um, from a New England Journal of Medicine uh, study that was published in 2014, it says, for almost every disease study, black Americans receive less effective care than white Americans. These disparities persisted despite matching for socioeconomic and insurance status. So sometimes people talk, want to say, that what some of the disparities can be attributed to is purely to socioeconomics. And it's been really quite well proven through many different sophisticated ways of doing this kind of research to say that racism itself has detrimental effects, including on the body. So here's this most recent study about implicit bias called Racial Bias in Pain Assessment and Treatment Recommendations and False Beliefs About Biological Differences Between Blacks and Whites. This was a study that was involved uh, healthcare providers and medical, some of the medical students. And um, specifically, this work revealed that a substantial number of white lay people and medical students and residents hold false beliefs about biological differences, so-called, between blacks and whites and demonstrates that these beliefs predict racial bias in pain perception and treatment recommendation accuracy. So in other words, people are getting, uh, being perceived as not having, uh, black folks in particular, not having the same perception um, of pain and therefore being given less pain medication. Um, it's also sometimes attributed to concerns about they're being seeking for seeking pain medication, but it's also this, um, to me, bizarre uh, att attribution to um, a biological difference. 
It also provides, this study also provides the first evidence that racial bias and pain perception is associated with racial bias in pain treatment recommendations. Taken together, this work provides evidence that false beliefs about biological differences between blacks and whites continue to shape the way we perceive and treat black people. They are associated with racial disparities in pain assessment and treatment recommendations. One of the things that we know that makes it more likely that race implicit bias will show up is when there are times when there's less time or less resources. That's when people tend to rush into and go by their first thinking. And of course, that's exactly what we're dealing with in many um, of these healthcare situations right now. So the concern that implicit bias is more likely to show up in times like this um, is very real. So two other pieces um, that I wanted to bring forward um, in ways that people have been talking about some of these disparities. This is an article from the um, Brookings Institute. Black Americans were forced into social distancing long before the coronavirus. And I want to read some of Andre Perry's words to us. He says, for decades, Black people and Native Americans have been subject to a different kind of social distancing, segregation, discrimination, and devaluation. Far from a cure, this form of social distancing created a social disease that has made many of us sick, literally. According to a 2019 study, residential segregation, as I was speaking about before, makes black communities more susceptible to hospital closings. Another study published in 2014 found that an increase in the concentration of black people in a neighborhood is associated with a corresponding decrease in the availability of surgical equipment. Meanwhile, social isolation through policy discrimination has extracted significant wealth from black families. This article talks about how the racial wealth gap is making these households far more susceptible to the pandemic because of this. One of the um, pieces that you may have heard about is um, a particular and perverse way that um, the recommendation that people wear masks um, has um, inherent challenges for folks um, who are black. This article, I'm a black man in America, entering a shop with a face mask might get me killed. I trust the CDC's guidance, but my fear of being mistaken for an armed robber is greater than my fear of And lastly, one of the pieces that you may not have heard as much about to really continue to um, think about what are all, what's all behind these racial disparities, this deadly mix of COVID-19, air pollution, and inequality. And this um, article goes into how um, black and brown communities in New York and elsewhere have chronically been affected by air pollution and what that means in terms of health. Now, yes, there's less air pollution right now because there's less cars and fewer people driving around, but it, um, this is really about chronic exposure and not about um, a short-term exposure. Millions of Americans currently have conditions like hypertension and asthma that can be connected to air pollution. You may or may not know that hypertension, you may, asthma may make some sense, but in fact, hypertension in addition can be related to, uh, connected to air pollution. And of course, these are now associated with severe cases of COVID-19, but again, they're not distributed equally. Minoritized populations are bearing the brunt of this often deadly um, on April 5th, a, a study released by um, the uh, Harvard School of Public Health directly linked air pollution to a probability of more severe COVID-19 cases. That joins decades of scientific literature that suggests that race and income impact how much chronic air pollution you're exposed to. And it could be a major factor in the disproportionate, disproportionate COVID-19 mortality rates that we're seeing now in non-white populations. And here's a piece even more um, taking that one step further, which is a, a study from 2018 
that talks about um, that soot from air pollution is actually even reaching the placenta, the placenta being the organ that is um, grown, that is the blood interface between a fetus and the person carrying the, uh, the fetus. It says the damage from air pollution can begin even before some people are born. Researchers have found soot particles in mother's placentas, suggesting particulate matter that the mother breathes may impact fetal development. Exposure to air pollutants has been linked to low birth weight and premature births, which in turn have been linked to decreased lung function. And links between air pollution and childhood asthma deaths are established. Okay, so this is all pretty hard, and I will be getting to some like, where are we going with this? What are we going to do? I want to bring in, the next is just to talk a little bit about a, um, a global health perspective. And I want to um, first just begin with my, um, my experiences. So I've worked with a group called, this group called Results, which is a hunger and poverty citizens lobby, as Nancy mentioned in my introduction. Worked with um, Results for close to 30 years. When I first began working with Results, so I'm going to talk just a little bit, go in the direction of global health. We'll come back to the the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. When I first began working with results, um, the statistic that I would cite very often was that 42,000 children died each day of malnutrition and preventable causes. And that was true. That was in 1991. 42,000 children every single day were dying of malnutrition, of measles, of other kinds of preventable diseases. That statistic, which was 42,000 then in 1991, is now less than 14,000 children each day, which is still a lot. But tremendous, remarkable progress has been made. So it's a reminder of what is possible. I say it raises this question, which I'm sure has occurred to many of you, no matter what issue that you're close to as we've been going through this pandemic, and watching what has been mobilized. Um, I've been thinking about needless childhood mortality and nutritional stunting. I think about the 300,000 women who die from cervical cancer every year, uh, largely in sub-Saharan Africa. That's a disease that is essentially preventable by vaccination, almost completely preventable. I think about global climate change. I think about the disproportionate incarceration and detention of black and brown people. I think about homelessness, all these things that we've been heard for decades that there is not the money nor the will to address these issues at the scale that they're needed. And here we are, appropriating dollars in the trillions, changing our social structure and really every aspect of our lives. And it's hard not to pause and say, why? And why now? And I am not arguing that we should be doing anything different. Um, we need to stop this um, devastation of this pandemic. Hundreds of thousands of people are going to die um, who would not otherwise have died. And we need to do something about that. Um, and as I've talked about, the people who are, um, who, who will be paired are more likely to be people who are historically marginalized in our societies folks of color, poor folks, people have already been living with more illness and dying earlier already. So why are we addressing this with the urgency that we are? I think we all need to be asking that and you've likely thought of your own reasons. Um, I feel like I need to mention that in this case, everyone of every class is at risk. And as the saying goes, your money cannot completely protect you. I think about when um, um, there's a new infection, this happened with um, HIV when it first came um, as a pan began, when it was a pandemic, the people, everyone who got it passed from it. There was no treatment. And as we began to know more, the people um, and know more both how to prevent it and how to treat it and make it into a chronic illness, now the folks who are the most likely still to die are poor folks and disenfranchised folks for all over the world. So it makes me think about how do we want to take advantage of this moment? What do we want to do with it? Um, so I want to come back to some of these successes like children 
who are not dying, but more just 14,000 who are dying. Um, we're in a world where global, po global poverty is not what it's been, nor is global literacy. So when I was a kid, fewer than half of the people in the world could read. That's been true for all of human history, that fewer than half of the people in the world could read. And now the global literacy rate is nearly 90%. This progress in who can read and has transformed the world and the relationship of literacy to girls, um, literacy of girls to gender equity has and continues to be transformational. So I wanted, I'm going to come back to this slide. The other success I want to keep our eyes on is this Global Alliance for Vaccines, or GAVI. So it's an international coalition that operates basically as a clearinghouse where nations of the global south have combined their purchasing power and they make the cost of vaccines plunge and the rates of vaccination rise. Um, it primarily vaccinates children and since 1990 has saved 100 million children's lives. So I wanna raise your awareness of Gavi because when we think about how the COVID-19 vaccine will be distributed once it is available, when that is, around the world, I'm really excited and optimistic about our global ability to create and distribute and administer vaccines to folks in the global south We'll see what happens in the global north. And Gavi will be an important mechanism to get those vaccines to the poorest communities in the world. So we do need to come back to what's happening with um, the difference between um, the, in the US. Uh, actually, before I do that, I'm gonna just show you one more thing about the global situation. So, um, this is what is happening in the world right now in terms of school closures. More than 90% of school children are not in school all over the world right now. Something else that's going to need really our attention, um, some people obviously are being taught remotely and many, many aren't. And so what we do, uh, so everyone except the blue are not in school right now. And in the pink, it's more lo the localized, but certainly really a dramatic, uh, dramatic change in what's happening. And we know the strong relationship between education and health. So something that needs to have our attention. So I think part of what I'm excited about, let's see, I'm going to do this next part. Um, some things looking forward. Oh, we're so perfect on timing. Um, looking forward, what are some of the ways that we're going to be able to um, move ourselves um, out of this? I want to, um, in results, we work a lot on uh, the elimination of tuberculosis, um, which still kills um, about a million people a year and um, is still largely, and is a largely disease of the poor. Um, but in the United States, um, we were very successful in beating tuberculosis. And there's a lot of lessons that we can learn for how this, um, how this was done. And it's some of the things that you're already hearing about. Search, treat, and prevent. Searching out folks who have active infections, um, community-focused mobilization, uh, going and finding people who are ill, and then importantly, giving them the uh, social support and the, the physical support that they need to stay where they are and get better um, and not infect anyone else. So it's really exciting that we can, there's a lot of lessons um, in the kind of community mobilization and training of community health workers that can happen around that is very exciting. Um, Dr. Joya Mukherjee, who's another of my heroines from the uh, Heroes from uh, Partners in Health, has said that um, community-wide coronavirus teams, um, thousands of people also helping to mitigate the economic impact of the pandemic. There are a number of exciting um, places that people are moving forward, communities of opportunity um, in King County. Um, this is a they're um, giving monies away for a, from a community response fund to um, see what wants to come from the community to make a difference. This is a very inspiring article, I think that uh, Zoltan may have mentioned um, by Rebecca Zolnit. 
some really great things that are happening in a lot of communities, um, all of the mutual aid, many of the things that Sultan mentioned in terms of uh, mutual aid and community resilience and organizing together. Here's some folks uh, putting together and giving out packets in their neighborhoods. Okay. So I want to end with two um, quotes and then a little, uh, yeah, maybe I'll just end with these. So this is again from the disability um, activist who wrote the New York Times op-ed. And so this is a little bit more looking inward. And I want to read um, Elliot's words. I have spent years of my life rarely leaving home. Being at stuck at home due to illness often sucks, but sometimes it is other things too. Calm. The kinds of connections that can only come from profound slowness, from borrowing uh, down instead of stretching out. Even as we withdraw physically, our emotional and spiritual need for others has never been more visible. We already know that we needed one another in intimate ways that go beyond the capacity of our bodies to connect. Disabled people are experts in deep, luscious intimacy without touch. We are used to being creative. As the Disability Justice Performance uh, uh, Project sends out Ambilad, Balid, sorry, says, <clears throat> we love barnacles. We love like barnacles. We love like barnacles, sticking to one another wherever and however we can. I appreciate those words. And I want to leave us on a more political note. Historically, this is from uh, um, Arundhati Roy, one of my inspirations. Historic have forced humans to break with the past and imagine their world anew. This one is no different. It is a portal, a gateway between one world and the next. We can choose to walk through it dragging the carcasses of our prejudice and hate, our avarice, our data banks and dead ideas, our dead rivers and smoky skies behind us. Or we can walk through lightly with little luggage, ready to imagine another world and ready to fight for it. I think that is what we are prepared to do. I hope that we can continue to prepare and take our power and our creativity and um, I'm actually quite optimistic that we can uh, change and move things forward. Okay, that's it. Let's take a, where are we at? It is 2.32. So we're going to take a, just about a three-minute break, just a quick break. Um, you can now put some um, questions in the chat window. It looks like me, or the, excuse me, the Q&A. Um, it looks like we may have some, and I'm very happy that I have a moderator who's going to help uh, figure out, quest read some questions, and um, we'll have plenty of time. But let's take a little break. We'll come back uh, and then go through some questions. Thank you. Okay. So welcome back. So uh, I think I'll listen for questions and then um, do my best to answer. There's looks like there's still room for more questions as folks have them. So if you want to type them into the Q and A, uh, you are welcome. Okay, please go ahead. Okay, great. The first question: Would this global pandemic be considered a form of trauma for some question for some people, whether or not they were able-bodied and minded before the pandemic? Well, I think that we may well all know the answer to that. Absolutely. No question. Um, and I think one of the concerns, so as I talked about stress and that part of what happens is when we're under a chronic stress, um, that this qualifies, right? We're going to be, we've been doing this for a while. So you asked about trauma. I think, I think of trauma as a, um, I think I'm thinking of it in the, you know, in terms of um, stress, that's how I'm translating it. And no question that it is. One of the things that um, is a, um, worth knowing about how we deal with trauma and how we do, well, I'll know stress more than I know 
trauma. I think of um, that maybe a little bit more broadly and including psychology. I'm not a psychologist. What I know about the body is that every bit that we do to help in that moment to engage our, so when we're stressed, our sympathetic nervous system is what's engaged. When we're um, not stressed and the, and the opposing nervous system is the parasympathetic nervous system, all of the, even something as simple as any kind of relaxation, connecting, um, however it is that we can slow ourselves down helps and so that can always it's not an all or none um every bit of that helps and we did a very fun exercise in our class this fall where we thought about if you do something positive for yourself and then you feel better and so you end up doing something more positive and so you feel better like it is possible to get into kind of a positive cycle that may be a little bit harder to believe. It's very easy to think about times when we're like, I feel bad, so I ate some crappy food, so I felt worse, so I, and then I stayed up late, and then I didn't, you know, so it happens in both directions, but I would just say that those ways, all those ways that we take care of ourselves and we help to take care of others um, can really help. Um, I um, didn't, I can, I, the other thing that I would say is that many of the, and in fact, most of the long-term effects on the body that happen associated with stress are all re are reversible. Um, so inflammation, there's actually, if you know anything about biology and homeostasis and how we have all these things that keep our blood sugar and other, all kinds of other things in the right level of not too much, oh, too much, let's bring it down, too low. So inflammation, it turns out, is in that same way. And we have regulatory systems that try to de, uh, that, that are, we have anti-inflammatory systems within our bodies. And our parasympathetic nervous system, so if it's getting too technical, but all of our rest and relaxation, that system can help to calm and heal our bodies and our minds, our mind bodies. So I hope that's helpful. Okay, thanks. And I think this can, this is a, a, just an add on question to what you, you just said. Um, does long term experience with stress influence the data we're seeing regarding age? And do children tend to be more resilient against stress than adults? Okay, can you read the first part again? Because I'm not sure that I, yeah, thanks. Sure. Does long-term experience with stress influence the data we're seeing regarding age? And the way I'm interpreting that is, is that why people who are older maybe are more vulnerable? Oh, I see. Yeah, actually, that's great. Okay. So age, the, the relationship of age to, um, to stress and then to resilience. So um, I understand it. No. I mean, certainly chronic stress if you're older it is possible that you will have had a lot of chronic stress and it is also there but there i think the things that are associated with dangers the dangers associated with um age and the virus have more to do with our um of course they're all interrelated but more have to do with our healing system so all kinds of there are all kinds of changes that happen with time our connective tissue is not as strong. Um, that allows when something starts to get inflamed, our lungs, the little alveoli, the little sacs in our lungs are more likely to collapse. Our blood vessels, unfortunately, over time, probably have more damage in them. So yes, that can be related to stress, but even age unto, unto itself, um, even with someone who's lived a relatively stress-free life, those kinds of things associated with aging are going to happen without stress and you could say that there's a way that stress chronic stress can be it you know accelerate that certainly um but they are they are to some degree different physiologic um are kids more resilient to stress i mean i am not a lifespan development <laughs> expert that's my understanding certainly the ability to um, heal and um, that 
happens physically and we're, since we're mind bodies, that would certainly also be true, you know, of kids. Um, I think kids also have much all that whole ability to be with the present and not wish that we were somewhere else, which is part of where that self-induced stress comes from. I think that's for at least younger kids, that may be part of what makes it them more resilient, but I'm not an expert in any of that. So that's just my thoughts. Okay, this one is a, on a completely different part of what you're talking about. Um, okay. Here's the question. Mm -hmm. What are some of the perspectives, debates, or tensions you're seeing in the public health community about when and how to return to normal, if there is such a thing? <laughs> yeah. Um, I Well, I think probably they're ones that you've heard about in the news. I would say that, you know, real concern... So the concern about um, if we don't have herd immunity, if we don't have um, the, uh, if nothing changed in terms of all of our susceptibility and we start to socialize more, the likelihood that there will be a resurgence, I think that's certainly one of the things that's talked about. Um, and um, I, th I sense a lot of excitement about what is possible if attention is paid where the disparities are now. So can the lack of public health care workers be turned into a resurgence in support for public health? Can um, this revealing of what we've already known in terms of health disparities be a place where actual attention to addressing the disparities can happen. Um, so can this be the leverage that we're looking for? So that's more of a longer term rather than the sort of opening back up. Um, I, um, I will say that on the list service that I'm on, I feel like a lot of, there is a great deal of desire to have um, quality data. Maybe it's just the epidemiologists who like love their data so that they can make sense and see where things are going and then use that to help shape. And I certainly think that the whole country has had a lesson in what happens when we don't know. So our lack of testing, um, yeah, so I'm not sure that I've heard anything that you wouldn't necessarily have heard out and around. Yeah. Great. Um, once again, another, another aspect of this. Okay. Of the statistics, I think. Uh -huh. What action translated into the reduced death rate reported? The reduced death rate reported. Yeah, so what, what has been happening that would result in a report of reduced death rates. Oh, most, oh, so overall, is that what you're saying? I assume so. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that there's every, um, so one of the, again, terms that you probably, who knew that they were gonna know what an R naught was? Um, but I think that the, so R naught is a um, term used in epidemiology to say how many people um, if someone has an infection, how many others will they infect? That has biological characteristics associated with the, the viral infection, kind of the pathophysiology of the virus. But it also is influenced by what are called, you know, so these non-pharmaceutical um, interventions, NPIs, because we don't have PIs, we don't have pharmaceutical invention, interventions for this. So looking at the different, all the different interventions that we're taking it does seem like that is what we are that is absolutely what it can be you know attributed to and I think part of where we're seeing uh yeah so um you know that as far as I understand it that's exactly why why we're having where we're having success that is exactly why is for just all the reasons that we know that's how we can, if we can have it, you know, the ideal is we get it to that an R naught of less than one, each one person inf um, infects less than one person, person who has it, so that it can um, die out, or at least be, in, you know, considerably smaller. Um, yeah. Okay, I'm gonna, um, somebody 
just typed in a, a comment, and that is, thanks for this amazing presentation. Mm -hmm. um, the next question, though, is how do we use this knowledge? In other words, how do we use what oh. you've been telling us to help those who are hit the hardest? Thank you for asking that. And I, I, I got so, I, uh, I, thank you for asking. I wish I'd spent a little more on it. Now's my chance. Where I think that we want to um, go and what I'm understanding from my colleagues who are really concerned about this is we should um, have those who be most prioritized in every way, in testing, in healthcare, in support, in, um, and in prevention. So we know who the vulnerable communities are and what does it mean to get to um, the communities where health literacy may be considerably less, um, where, and certainly where, you know, options of not being able to stay home. So, you know, um, paid sick leave, better, you know, all of the financial um, support that we're doing. So we know what people need to be able to stay um, healthy and prevent this. And so, Prior, so, so what can we do? I mean, one of the things certainly that we can do is um, become involved locally and try to do our best to make sure that communities around us who we know are most vulnerable are getting the services that they need. Um, I'm a political animal. I also would say that there's um, really are some amazing things that are happening in Congress that we can have an influence on. The fourth bill is being shaped right now. It's likely to have money for um, food stamps or SNAP but who's gonna get it and how big the increase is gonna be is still being debated. There's a, um, a move to try to get $100 billion in emergency rent, uh, and we know the precarity of housing and how important that is for getting people back um, into, for keeping people safe, being people um, to, stay, to stay away from others, to stay sheltered. So, um, I think it's always uh, my experience that people don't know the power that we have. We don't know the power that we have politically. Um, and uh, just, we were just, I actually was in a meeting with um, Representative Derek Kilmer and my colleagues from Results on Friday. He was reading us the number of communications that he was getting on each issue. Every single one of those was recorded, and he had that right in front of him. If you don't think that those don't make a difference cumulatively, but you know that when you contact them, they're thinking that you're probably representing, depending on the office, you know, anywhere from um, a few hundred to several hundred people, because you were the one who took the initiative to do it. Um, and even more coming up with, you know, developing relationships with our elected officials. Um, it can make a tremendous difference. And so there actually are... There are things going on. I mean, who knew that we would have universal basic income voted through? <laughs> like, remarkable things are happening. And um, so I think we can continue to have an influence there. Thanks. Oh, you're muted, maybe, Julie? This is a question about. Um, sources, Carolyn, and you may have already answered it, but sure. um, you may want to yeah. say whether your, your slides will be available. Are we worried about the degree of accuracy of any of the data we're receiving? And have you questioned the accuracy of any of the data you've shared today? That's a great question. I have gotten the data. Um, so in my slides, I have the all of the um, stories, but you'll notice that a number of them are um, from um, journalists, and I've gone back, so all of them have, well, the ones that are linked to original studies I've gone back and looked at, but I've also been on a number of webinars, um, and um, some of the slides and some of the information that I've gotten um, are from those folks. They are reputable people that I know of, but I have not been able to ascertain, to go to primary sources on everything that I've heard. Um, so I would encourage you to, so I will be posting my slides to the WordPress site. It has the links under each of the, um, slides for where I got my information and I would love to have that verified. I've done my best. Um, and I also was sipping from a fire hose. So I am sure that there is, uh, some of it that was, um, I didn't have time to thoroughly vet and it's a great question. 
Okay, ready. This is another question about um, sources, which you may or may not be able to answer, because as you just mentioned, you're sipping from a... Um, so are you aware of any formal structural strategies for producing and representing um, data so that it can effectively represent intersectional oppression? That is a great question. I, um, sorry, let me, sorry, I heard intersection. Can you read the question again? I just want to make sure that I answer what was asked. Sure. Um, are you aware of any formal structural strategies okay. for producing and representing data so that it can more effectively represent intersectional oppression? Yeah, great question. I would say um, I am aware of some of the um, organizations that I've been following their data um, are increasingly trying to look through the intersectional lenses. Part of what is saying is the lack of data, and I mentioned that at the beginning a bit. Um, it's why um, I think people are so. Um, I think we're looking at some are more individual identities. So we're look, there's some that's looking at race and there's some looking at gender and how are, as an example um, of intersectional. Um, and there's a real paucity of the data. I was, I was surprised to see that one, for an example, um, something that the CDC was willing to put out that had basically some of, they had statistics, but it was on a sample of maybe six or 7% of the cases that they had because they didn't have data on race, because they didn't have data on a number of other things. So um, what most of the data sets that I've seen have been coming out have been saying, this is not complete, this is what we have, please work with what we have because we're trying to get it out there. So I think it's early on, I think it's a deep need and I am not aware with the exception of a few organizations that are trying to, that are attempting to get those data, but it's not, um, it's not yet happening on a systematic level that I know of, which doesn't mean it's not happening. It's just not what I've been finding. Um, there's, a, I will just say, if people are interested, a lot of where I've got my information is a great listserv, social justice, public health listserv called Spirit of 1848. And, um, I didn't put my, um, I'm happy to answer emails and direct people to how to join that. Um, and it's a very busy listserv right now. And it has a lot of great information. That's where I've gotten a lot of my information from. Thanks. Okay, what are some of the non-medical interventions? I think, you'd, I think you talked about this briefly before. And the rest of the question is, um, is it only about isolation and distancing? Or are there other non-medical interventions? Um, I mean, I think that the ones that we've heard of in terms of, you know, both personal care, you know, washing hands and, you know, things along those lines. Um, the, I mean, those really are the, um, I mean, I, I didn't go into a lot of this. And it may be that our speaker next week will go into it more. I'm, I'm, I was thinking that it might be sort of more known about, so what masks do is prevent our, us from infecting others for the most part, unless we have ones that are protective for us. Um, the N95s, we're not likely to be protected by them. Um, medical, so I don't know that I have anything except sort of the standard pieces that are out there, and I don't have all of those at the, off the top of my head. Um, I mean, I guess the other thing that I would say, maybe to reflect back on what I was talking about earlier, is that what... Um, our bodies do with good sleep, good nutrition, um, good mental health, because we're mind bodies, um, you know, all of that to the extent that we can really is a great protection. I mean, so that we are likely to, to the extent that we can, if we were to become infected, um, to be able to respond, have our immune system respond as it should and, um, or as it hopefully will, and uh, effectively. And those things, even in the short run, um, can, they can make a difference, definitely. 
Okay, I noticed that um, you're a doctor of veterinary medicine. Do you know in what ways the pandemic may be affecting animals? Um, yeah, thanks. I The one thing that I've heard is, well, <laughs> I guess a few things that I'd say. Everybody's, the pets are liking it. That's what I understand. <laughs> because everybody, I know our dog and our cat are very happy um, because we're there more. Um, I think you mean maybe more physiologically. So I have a um, there, there is a cats can um, be infected with the SARS virus. Most viruses are very species specific, and um, but the protein that helps to um, enter or the and the receptor um, on cat cells and human cells seem to be relatively similar, um, and so it does seem that cats can potentially get infected. Um, other species know, um, from what I understand, and I don't know how widespread that is. The last report that I heard said that cats couldn't, it wasn't going to go, it didn't go the other way. You could infect your cat, but your cat couldn't infect you, but it's all very new and early. Um, that's the, those are the main things that I know. I guess the thing that I didn't, there's a lot that I didn't get to. It's well worth mentioning as a veterinarian. I want to talk just for a minute about One Health. What's the concept of One Health? And that's just the concern and the recognition. And actually, in my article, the articles that I resources that I put, there's an article about this. The um, bat to pangolin to human mutation of the virus is something that, um, if we look at it from a uh, broader perspective, involves ecological disruption. A lot of people have written about this. I think it's really important to pay attention to that. Um, when we're looking that it's not, oh, there just happened to be this bat virus that happened to be, that happened to infect people, that a long history of these zoonotic diseases, so these zoonotic meaning from animals to people um, and, and vice versa, um, that they are have very deep relationships to ecological destruction and, and a lot of different ways that we're changing physical environments um, such that we encounter animals or they encounter us in ways that we didn't previously. So it's just an important piece to bring into the discussion of that. And it, the term One Health is about recognizing that we're, we need to be concerned about that, that animal health and human health are very much related. So thank you for the question. We are running out of time. There, mm -hmm. there are two more questions I hope we can, we can get in, if, if, if possible. Sure. Um, and the first one, I think, is probably a short answer. Do you know if benign, in quotes, do you know if benign heart conditions, such as premature atrial contractions, have also been risk factors for COVID-19? Mm, this is definitely where I'm going to take the I treat four-leggeds, not two-leggeds. Yeah. <laughs> It's a great question, and I uh, yeah I wouldn't I uh, I wouldn't I wouldn't. Be able do you to have Do you have a sense of a source this um, the asker might consult? Uh, maybe their own primary caregiver. Definitely, that's what I would think because I mean APCs, so immature atrial premature contractions can be common from a number of different um, underlying conditions, and that would probably be the more important thing. So yeah, I would think definitely consulting with a clinician would be the way to go yeah okay can you define herd Im immunity and <laughs> how we know it's emerged or developed yeah it's a great question okay so herd immunity is the idea that um, once there are enough people cattle whoever anyway in a group um, once there's enough um, individuals who have immunity to the virus, any virus, then if someone is infected, it can't really, like they keep encountering people who are immune. And so they can't really infect very many people. And what that level is um, varies from virus to virus. So wildly contagious. And so, how, what percent of people, and most of the time, herd immunity refers, means a good at least 80% and usually 90 and sometimes closer to 95% of individuals need to have immunity enough that 
um, any one individual who's got the virus can interact, but it just isn't going to go anywhere. It just doesn't have enough. There aren't enough people that you would encounter to give it to where it can keep spreading. So we're nowhere near that with this new virus. That's the big concern about it um, because it usually, for most viruses, it's at the lowest, usually mid 80s. And for some viruses, depending on their contagiousness, it needs to be even closer to 95 um, or more percent. With measles, it's, you know, it's around in there. So, um, so I hope that that answers the question. So the most likely way that we're gonna get herd immunity is through a vaccine or if enough of us over a very long time are, are become exposed. But right now, most of us are not getting exposed, which is great and safer, and also means that we still could be uh, become infected at some point. So that's the complex, the complexity of the situation that we're in right now. There are more questions, but I, I see that it's after three o'clock, so... I'm assuming that we're out of time. Um, thank you everybody for yes. asking what you did and um, look forward to you uh, logging on for the next uh, Pandemic Academy lecture. Very much, thank you for your attention, appreciate it. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>